Howdy y'all, this video is about Justice Scalia, who was my favorite justice for a long time. My favorite two justices for a long while were Justices Scalia and Breyer, but recently Kagan's been edging Breyer out. Anyway, um, Justice Scalia brought to the law the things that I like in a judge, that no matter whether he agreed with you or whether he disagreed with you, he did everyone the courtesy of telling them exactly what he thought, exactly what his views were, uh, what the, the, the result in the case uh, should be based on his, his reasoning, and uh, very clearly stating what his reasoning for it is. He, he used language to clarify rather than to obscure parts of the law. Other justices, uh, like Justice Kennedy, when he writes, they're very uh, over-the-top and saccharine and convoluted, and it's really hard to distill down what he's trying to talk about. I think he would have been well-served if he'd been a philosopher or perhaps a poet. Uh, not, the, not the most fun legal writing that you'll ever read. Justice Scalia, on the other hand, was a master draftsman, which is strange because he didn't really like writing. He liked having written, but not the actual writing itself, and yet he was one of the most prolific justices in the history of the court. He was one of the most uh, active judges, and I don't mean activist, but one of the most active justices on the court. He was doing tours, uh, going to different places and doing speaking and writing books. I mean, he was all over the place. He took more trips in his last year on the court than anyone else. Um, Justice Scalia loved learning, like he had a real, a real passion for learning new things, and he had the capacity to do it too. He had a, an exquisite intellect and a, a wonderful mind. I want you to suppose, or imagine yourself being like 75, 70, 80 years old, and still, and still getting that, uh, that, that jolt of excitement when you learn something. There was, a, I'll, I'll put a link to it. Uh, I'll put an excerpt in here. Uh, there was a, uh, an oral argument happening in the court, as happens. And one of, the, uh, one of the advocates used the word orthogonal, which Justice Scalia didn't, didn't uh, beforehand know. And uh, this just sums up his, his, his uh, love of learning, that even in his, in his mid-70s, pushing 80 years old, uh, he's still like a kid in a candy store when new knowledge comes to him. I think that issue is entirely orthogonal to the issue here, because the, the Commonwealth is acknowledging... I'm sorry, entirely what? Orthogonal, right angles, unrelated, oh. irrelevant. What was that okay. adjective? I like that. Or, or, orthogonal. Orthogonal. Right, right. Ooh. Okay. I, I knew this case presented I, us a problem. <laughs> I should have said, I probably should have said. I think we should use that in the opinion. I thought I'd seen, I thought I'd seen it before. Or the dissent. That's a, a bit of per One thing that anyone who's ever appeared before him or uh, listened to him uh, when he talks or whatever, uh, one thing that they will immediately appreciate is that Justice Scalia was extremely well educated in the law um, and on top of that he was extraordinarily well pre uh, pre uh, prepared for the cases that were coming before him. Uh, judges, judges on an appellate court aren't experts in every, in, in every particular area of the law. They're generalists. Uh, they may have had a specialty before they, got, uh, before they got onto the bench but you don't become an expert in all areas of the law. You become, you're a generalist and you rely on the advocates to point out what the relevant issues of the law are, and then with some of your own independent investigation, once you've had the cases uh, briefed to you, read through it and see what else is there. But anyway, um, he just had a mastery of the law. He, there was this one, this is in the Gu Guantanamo Bay cases, and uh, former Solicitor General Seth Waxman, Waxman was uh, arguing before the court, and Justice Scalia is asking him for a single case where that fit the situation that was at hand, it was technical, but anyway, and so uh, Seth just goes through a case, and as soon as he mentions it, Justice Scalia is like, that case was this and that and the other, and this just went back and forth. And finally, after uh, that went on for a while and some, some other digressions happened, uh, the counsel came back and said, I'd like to take one more opportunity at persuading you, Justice Scalia. And his response was, set him up. You know, set him up, I'll keep knocking him down. Um, he had a real love for the, the parry and thrust of debate. But anyway, oh, Waxman said at the end of it, he goes, I guess I have to plead exhaustion of remedies here, Justice Scalia. So I want to talk about, uh, or, um, okay, he was really witty, extremely funny, very bright, and I want to read a couple of excerpts from uh, the things that he said in various opinions. This is from uh, when he was on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, just his, his wit and uh, humor comes through in his opinions. This case, the case was Community Nutri Nutrition uh, Institute versus Block. This case involving legal requirements for the content and labeling of meat products, such as frankfurters, affords a rare opportunity to explore simultaneously both parts of Bismarck's aphorism, 
that no man should see how laws or sausages are made. The, the irony of the case was not lost on him. Uh, I'm going to go through some just excerpts here, and then I'll get to the meat of the video uh, later on, or what I think uh, or the important things about his, his legacy will be. Anyway, um, there was a case, if you remember in the 80s, there was like uh, child molestation, paranoia, and daycare centers running rampant, and discovered memories, and all this other shit that would show up in the court. So, in, the, in 1990, the Supreme Court dealt with the conviction arising from that phenomenon, and the, uh, the states, uh, some of the prosecutors in the states had come to realize that uh, when you put a four-year-old on the stand, they don't they're not going to perform particularly well. So if you can just find a way to have a trial without the witness against the defense uh, and still get the defendant convicted, more power to you. In other words, if you can find a way to just ignore the Constitution, uh, knock yourself out. So what they would do is um, they would have virtual trials where the child would not actually appear in court. They would be in another room where there was a video camera and it would be on the, on the kid and the jury could watch essentially a television program while someone uh, asks the child questions. You can't see whether or not the, the lawyer who's asking the questions is uh, like, pro, you know, not um, trying to encourage the child to answer yes or no or anything like that. So a uh, person was convicted, goes up to court, the case is Maryland v. Craig. Justice Lee was in dissent. Uh, and he, he writes, um, I am persuaded, therefore, that the Maryland procedure is virtually constitutional. Since it is, however, n uh, since it is not, however, actually constitutional, I would affirm the judgment of the Maryland Court of Appeals reversing the judgment of conviction. In other words, uh, the whole of Justice, not the whole, but a substantial part of Justice Scalia's life, I would, uh, life in general, his professional life, is, is wrapped up in the notion that words on the page mean what they say. They don't mean something close to what they say. They mean exactly what they say. And whatever they say is exactly what they mean. And it is the law. We are a nation of laws, not of men, not of secret devils or, or angels whispering uh, whatever in people's ears. It is the words on the page promulgated by the legislature uh, and the Constitution that govern all of us. Judges the same as everyone else. And if it's written on the page and you don't like it, tough shit. Get out of court. Anyway. So, an example of some of his uh, good imagery here. As to the court's invocation, though this is the Lamb's Chapel case, the famous Lamb's Chapel case. As to the court's invocation of the lemon test, like some ghoul in a late-night horror movie that repeatedly sits up in its grave and shuffles abroad after being repeatedly killed and buried, lemon stalks our establishment clause jurisprudence once again, frightening the little children and school attorneys of the school district. Its most recent burial, only last term, was, to be sure, not fully six feet under. Our decision in Lee against Wiseman conspicuously avoid, avoided using the supposed test, but also declined the invitation to repudiate it. Over the years, however, no fewer than five of the currently sitting justices, in their opinions, personally, have driven uh, pencils through the creature's heart, the author of today's opinion repeatedly, and a sixth has joined an opinion doing so. The secret of, Lemon's tests, of, of the Lemon test's survival, I think, is that it is so easy to kill. It is there to scare us and our audience when we wish it to do so, but we can command it to return to the tomb at will. Such a docile and useful monster is worth keeping around, at least in a somnolent state. One never knows when one might need him. Uh, by my lights, the only other justice in the history of the Supreme Court who writes as well as Justice Scalia, they're pretty much on a par, was Justice Robert Jackson. Uh, so, that's just some good imagery, and here, this is the PGA Golf Tour, uh, a short excerpt from uh, his decision, I'm sorry, from his opinion on the outcome of the case. If one assumes, however, that the PGA Tour has some legal obligation to play classic platonic golf, and if one assumes the correctness of all other wrong turns the court has made to get to this point, then we, justices, must confront what is indeed an awesome responsibility. It has been rendered the solemn duty of the Supreme Court of the United States, laid upon it by the Congress in pursuance of the federal government's power to, quote, regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states, and quote, U.S. Constitution Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, to decide what is golf. I am sure that the framers of the Constitution, aware of the 1457 Edict of King James II of Scotland prohibiting golf, because it interfered with the practice of archery, fully expected that sooner or later the paths of golf and government, the law and the links, would once again cross. 
and that the judges of this august court will someday have to wrestle with that age-old jurisprudential question for which their, their years of study in the law have so well prepared them. Is someone riding around in a golf course from shot to shot really a golfer? The answer, we learn, is yes. This, the court ultimately concludes, and it will henceforth be, the law of the land, that walking is not a fundamental aspect of golf. Just the sarcasm that drips out off of it. Now, these are his written opinions where he has a lot of time to think about it and craft things and revise it. So he gets it really, uh, really good there. But even in oral arguments, when you know the things are actually live and it's the parry and thrust of a de of a debate, he is really, really witty. And uh, if a counsel is saying something that's rather goofy, and tries to be somewhat uh, creative and using a metaphor or whatever, Justice Scalia likes to reach out, grab that metaphor, twist it around, and shove it right back whence it came. He will hoist them uh, by their own petard. So. Um, in, uh, in a case called Kennedy against Louisiana, Jeffrey Fisher was arguing that the death penalty uh, is applied to uh, a ra the brutal rape of a, of, a, of a child is not a crime sufficiently bad to warrant the death penalty. And indeed, that there is a consensus opinion throughout the United States that such is the case. Notwithstanding the fact that many states uh, uh, allowed for it, they haven't, got, they haven't gotten rid of the, of the death penalty. One of the arguments that was given a long while ago is that you look at the trend, what the states are doing, and then when that wasn't convenient, it was just you kind of hold on. Anyways, the shifting legal sands. And uh, so Jeffrey Fisher says, uh, let me find it, uh, in talking about how you can find a, a majority from the case's opinions of the Supreme Court that side with him, and he was picking and choosing different justices from various opinions and saying that if you add this to that, then it comes up with the, with the view that, uh, that this is, is bad. And uh, just background on that, we've had a couple justices who have sat on the Supreme Court who think that the only criminal uh, sanction that is actually uh, mentioned in the Constitution as being lawful violates the Constitution. The, pen the death penalty is the only punishment that the Constitution mentions, and it says the death penalty is acceptable. And you still have justices that go, oh, yes, of course, the Constitution says it's acceptable, but that violates the Constitution. And he was seizing upon some of those people, and uh, anyway, Scalia pounces. Um, that's, a, that's a strange way of making a majority, isn't it? Two people who think even, even the death penalty for murder is no good. They're going to uh, uh, form the majority of people who, who consider whether a lawful death penalty can be imposed for rape. I think, at least in those circumstances, you, you have to discount the, uh, the people who would not allow, allow the death penalty under any circumstances for any crime. Well, I'm not aware of any wrinkle in this court's jurisprudence that says that if a justice is too far out of the mainstream that their vote is discounted. He's considering the issue that is before the court. The issue before the court is whether whether a permissible death penalty can be imposed for this crime. These parties say there's no such thing as a permissible death penalty. I mean, it would be if that wrinkle isn't there, we should iron it in quickly. <laughs> so you know, he takes the uh, the the metaphor and he runs with it. Um. So that was uh, Kennedy against Louisiana. Um, other ones where you can just hear the dripping sarcasm to make a point, is a case uh, Crawford against Washington. This is a case where um, states, this came out of some Supreme Court jurisprudence from years before, but anyway, states were trying to, in effect, do trial by affidavit. If, if, if they can't get a witness on the stand, then what they'll do is they'll just take a statement from the witness, uh, introduce the statement into the evidence, and then say that uh, the confrontation clause has been satisfied. Apparently, you can just uh, really get that uh, that piece of paper up on the stand and give it a good cross examination. So, in Crawford against uh, Washington, the attorney for the state of Washington st starts off. Uh, this is where this opens. This is the very beginning of his case, and uh, we'll take it from there. The, the, the primary part. Of Ohio versus Roberts that's important to the state is the reliability factor and the reason that, that that's important is because essentially Ohio
just real quick here, the argument here is that if the statement is reliable, then you can just admit it. But the whole point of a trial is to test the credibility of the evidence that's been introduced, the evidence of the witnesses or what, scientific evidence, whatever it is. The whole point of a trial is, is that uh, you can't assume that things are credible. That's not for a court to decide. That's the province of the jury to decide credibility. Is this witness cred credible? Should I believe them? Should I disbelieve them? And uh, anyway, so the, the state of Washington was arguing that if, if it is reliable, then the defendant doesn't have the right uh, to insist on live testimony in court in front of the jury. Al versus Roberts recognizes that there are other rights and interests at stake in a criminal trial other than the defendant's confrontation rights. Uh, for example, it recognizes that society as a whole has an interest in uh, seeing that uh, criminal activity is properly addressed. Uh, we could have written it that way, I suppose. I mean, the Confrontation Clause, instead of saying in all criminal prosecutions the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him, we could have added, comma, unless there are other considerations. That's it doesn't say that. It says in all criminal prosecutions the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. That's, that's correct, Your Honor. And when I... Where, where, I mean, I don't understand where we derive this permissibility of not allowing him to confront the witnesses against him so long as we come to the judgment that the evidence is inherently reliable. The, the right to uh, confrontation in, in a criminal prosecution, the right to a trial, is a complete nonsense if you can get around it by saying, well, we've, we've, we have vouchsafed the reliability of this evidence. Uh, we believe that it is inherently reliable. Therefore, you, defense, don't get to say that it isn't. Uh, you don't get to demand that we put a live witness on the stand in the presence of the jury to, to speak their piece. Now, this particular statement was one where, uh, this is what they're calling a reliable statement. This is a bit unrelated to Scalia, but it's an interesting point nevertheless. Uh, it was a man and a woman, and uh, then a third man, and the fight had, been, uh, fight had broken out, and one stabbed the other. And they, the uh, guy who did the stabbing uh, was married to the woman, so their husband and wife and in Washington State. A spouse has the right to keep his or her spouse off the stand from testifying against him or her. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the perks of being married in Washington State. So instead of putting the woman on the stand because they couldn't get her because he wouldn't relinquish, relinquish his rights, they introduced a statement uh, that she gave. And they were saying that her, her uh, uh, being an eyewitness to the stabbing is reliable. Now in this statement, this woman said that she was drunk and that when the event happened, she closed her eyes and did not see what happened. And uh, her being drunk and not watching the event is what they said made her uh, the star witness to the actual stabbing of the event. Anyway, um, and there is a, another case called Mar uh, Maryland against King where uh, this is about take, swabbing people's cheeks for DNA when they've not been convicted of any crime just because they've, been, uh, they've come to the attention of law enforcement and can, uh, can those people be forced to submit a DNA sample. And this is how that case opened. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, since 2009, when Maryland began to collect DNA samples from arrestees charged with violent crimes and burglary, there have been 225 matches, 75 prosecutions, and 42 convictions, including that of Respondent King. Well, that's really good. I'll bet you if you conducted a lot of unreasonable searches and seizures, you'd get more convictions, too. That proves absolutely nothing. Uh, over the last few weeks, I've, I've gone back and listened to a lot of the cases that I like and read a lot of his opinions. Um, he's, he's just wonderful that way. Uh, you know, there have been cases that have come up where um, the state will, the government will be arguing about how uh, you know, this provision of the Constitution or that provision of the Constitution makes it inefficient for them. The, a lot of their arguments uh, for expanding the power of government is to say that uh, we, it's not efficient if we do it this way and it would be very useful to us to do it this other way, uh, where one way is uh, arguably not constitutional. Well, that's what's being debated. And sometimes Scalia, you can just see him sitting there with his hand on his cheek, just thinking, uh, here we go again. And he'll just interrupt and go, yeah, boy. 
That Fourth Amendment's really inconvenient, but, you know, there it is. Or whatever the amendment is. And, um... He'll also slip this into his opinion. You have to be a little bit side in baseball for some of these, but this is um this is his uh, reading his uh, opinion for the court um, when the when the opinion was published. But he was in the oral giving of it, as opposed to the written record. He decided to slip in a dig. Uh, that, I'll explain it to you after you after you listen to it. This is on child pornography. Congress has sought in recent years uh, to legislate against the increasing flow of child pornography, that is, pornography using child subjects. Um, although obscenity uh, has no First Amendment protection, uh, pornography does. Uh, the difference between the two, uh, you know it when you see it. Uh, That's a dig at Potter Stewart's uh, description of uh, a pornography in a case. and. Uh, essentially went a little bit like this. I cannot uh, delineate all the different things that constitute pornography, but I know it when I see it. And uh, that's that's gotten many laughs over the years. So let's uh, let's talk about his... Um, oh, before that, he will troll lawyers too. Uh, uh, Justice, Ken uh, Justice Scalia, if, if he had like a chat name, a pseudonym or whatever that he used on the internet in different forms like on 4chan, uh, he would be a prolific troll. He he had some talent. There was this one case. Uh, one of the lawyers in it was uh, John Roberts, who before was the Chief Justice, uh, or representing the U.S. government. And there was a uh, a lawyer for Florida, and it was about searching a car and a container in a car. If you had consent to search the car, did that include content, uh, consent to search containers that were inside the car? And uh, the the lawyer for the state of Florida, Mr. Neman is not a very good um, appellate lawyer for the um, he's not a very good oral advocate maybe he's good in writing or whatever but uh, when it comes to the actual back and forth of a hot bench not very good and they were you know the justices would ask uh, what if it's a trunk that's in the car can you open it yes what if it's locked can you pick the lock to open it uh, can you cut off the lock to open? you know t taking it all these different things and the lawyer's giving like a, a gibberish answer and so John Paul Stevens uh, decides to ask about uh, the paper bag that was at issue in this this case. You know, if, if it were rolled up, could they could they tear a little hole in it to look inside to see if there were drugs in it? And and this this attorney said yes. And Justice uh, Stevens is uh, he says, but if if I have a silk purse, can they do that? And the guy's argument was uh, he said um. Well, no, they can't. They can't go tearing holes into your silk purse. That you've paid a lot of money for that, and we wouldn't do it. And Justice Stevens is like, so the test is you can destroy the property, but you can't destroy the property if it would really upset the person who owns the property. And the guy said, yeah, I think that's right. And, and he's talking about this this brown paper bag. And so this is where Justice Scalia decides to join in with Justice Stevens and trolling this guy. Uh, to, to stake his constitutional resistance to this guy's argument on on a brown paper bag, the ode to the brown paper bag, and he's like, "This is my this is my paper bag. I didn't give you permission to destroy my paper bag." And uh, anyway, it goes on. It was hysterical. But anyway, uh, that's a good case. Now on to his uh, actual significance as a justice. He is one of the most important justices the Supreme Court has ever had. Justice Kagan wrote of him in, his, in the wake of his death the following quote, Nino Scalia will go down in history as one of the most transformational Supreme Court justices of our nation. Uh, his views on interpreting texts have changed the way all of us think about the law. I admired Nino for his brilliance and erudition, his dedication to energy, and his peerless writing. I completely agree with his peerless writing except possibly Justice Jackson. And I treasured Nino's friendship. I will always remember and greatly miss his warmth, charm, and generosity. Uh, she, she has uh, the, the better of that uh, description of him. That, that's about the best one I've seen. And it isn't empty rhetoric. Uh, if you remember Margaret Thatcher, when, uh, after she was out of power, she was uh, once asked what her greatest achievement, her greatest accomplishment in government is. And she, she had a kind of like a, a wry response, and she said, Tony Blair. Not that she was saying that we got, you know, conservative Tories are out of power and Labor's in. It's saying that in, in my wake, the Labor Party can no longer do same old, same old anymore. 
gone are those days. They now have to contend with a different political landscape and engage in a different conversation, such was uh, her premiership. So too is it the case with Justice Scalia. Oh wait, I need this one more time. Uh, in uh, Justice Scalia, as I mentioned, um, he did everyone the courtesy of telling them exactly what he thought and the precise reason that he thought it. He was very clear, very focused, and, and whatnot. Um, so, just, Justice Kagan clerked for Thurgood Marshall. By the way, in the, in the Yamino case from a little while ago, the brown paper bag case, uh, one of the answers that, uh, that the lawyer gave to why uh, something happened with the, the defendant um, giving permission to search it when, when the officer told the guy, I'm looking for drugs in your car. The guy just bought drugs and put them in a brown paper bag and put them in, in the car. And nevertheless, he goes, oh, yeah, go, you know, I don't have any problems. Go ahead and look. And so uh, when Justice Marshall was asking about this, why would, why would this guy? He knew that they wanted drugs. Yes. He knew that he had drugs. Yes. Uh, he knew this. Yes. So why, why did he say yes? And the lawyer's response was, he was bluffing. And Thurgood Marshall's like, he, he, was, he was bluffing the cops who had just told him that they... <laughs> and he goes, well, there could have been other good reasons. And Thurgood Marshall's like, I'm listening. Anyway, uh, Justice Kagan clerked for Thurgood Marshall. He is, or was, one of her mentors. Now, in a, in a case called this um, Citizens for the Preservation of Overton Park against Volpe, um, Justice Marshall wrote, uh, in, in a footnote, but the, the, uh, he wrote all that has been wrong in American law um, in the last half century or more, well, actually 50 years before Justice Scalia was on, on, the, uh, on the court. It encapsulates everything that led to a whole bunch of calamities. Anyway, in, in footnote 29, he writes, The legislative history of both Section 4F of the Department of Transportation Act and Section 138 of the Federal Aid Highway Act is ambiguous. Because of this ambiguity in the legislative history, it is clear that we must look primarily to the statutes themselves to find the legislative intent. Justice Scalia has changed the, um, the shape of the legal landscape. No more is it the case that you walk into the Supreme Court with this mindset that the text of a statute, the text of the Constitution, are irrelevant. That you resort to those as like the, oh, we can't figure this out any other way. I guess we'll have to do the dirty work of cracking open a, a statute book and reading the statutes. The Justice, as I mentioned, clarity, that words mean what they say and they don't mean what they don't say and they don't mean anything else. They mean exactly what they say uh, and they continue, to they continue to mean that for all time unless and until the people, through the democratic process, rewrite the law. The job of the judge, uh, as, as he's put it, the job of the honest, fair-minded judge, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, Congress gets to write stupid laws. If the stupid law does not contradict the Constitution, and it's, with, you know, it's within their enumerated powers, your job of the judge is to read it and go, this is incredibly stupid, and then apply it, exactly as it is written. That is the job of the judge. Well, in the half century and more before Justice Scalia, this, there was this uh, want of legislative intent that really the job of a judge was to divine the, the secret, unwritten intent of Congress, to, to figure this out not by reading the laws that govern people, but by reading committee reports and listening to floor speeches and all this and a whole bunch of the legislative uh, sausage making in the background. And from that, you would then derive principles which were the law and those would be applied to, to litigants as they come through. Justice Scalia's position is very simple. We are a country of laws. We are governed by the written word, enacted by the people through their, through their representatives or directly, if it's in the state that has direct, uh, direct, direct democracy. Um, and that is how it works. As, as he put it in a debate with uh, Justice Breyer, he, goes, I too, he said, I too believe in democracy. And I think the way that it works is this, the majority rules. What the majority wants, the majority gets. Democracy is mar uh, majoritarianism. He goes, but in a democracy like our republic, there are restrictions on the power of the majority to get what it wants. It will, the, the majority does not rule on religion. The majority does not rule on political speech. The majority does not rule 
on all these things. He goes, that's the Bill of Rights. It says, majority, you can't get what you want. But who imposed this restriction on the majority? The majority itself is the one that says, we aren't good enough to decide these issues for the rest of you. And so what we do instead is we elect people uh, you know, during elections, and then they go and they write the laws, and if we don't like them, we vote them out and get someone else, we replace them with someone else to write the laws that we do like or that we do want. And it is anti-democratic to try to do this through the, legis uh, through the judiciary as opposed to the legislature. Judge, uh, having rights is anti-democratic. It says, it, majority, it doesn't matter what you want. Shut up and go away. It, your opinion does not matter. You, as Justice Jackson put it uh, beautifully in, in a case, he's talking about um, uh, the right you know, political expression, how to worship, uh, trials, all this stuff. Because, um, these rights, these fundamental rights in our Constitution depend on the outcome of no election. They depend on, on the whim of no majority. They are a bulwark against the want of the majority. So, uh, Justice Scalia worked very hard over his, his career as a justice um, to bring in what he calls uh, text, uh, originalism, a particular kind of textualism. And it's the, not as it is uh, phrased by a lot of people, not in original intent. He doesn't care one whit about the intent of the legislator. He cares about the words enacted by the legislature. Distinction here, legislator being one person in the body, the legislature being the aggregate of those and what they have done. And if you want to, uh, so the original meaning, not the original intent. What do the words that were actually codified mean? What did they mean to the society uh, when, they were, when they were enacted? That is the meaning that they had then, and it's the meaning that they have now, and it is the meaning that they will have for all time, unless and until, through the democratic process, the American people, or the people of a state, get up and say, we want to change course. So, um, this, this, he gives an example of, if, if you meant to say no in a statute, but you wrote yes, tough shit. You wrote this, that is what you were bound by. And if it is wrong, so long as it doesn't violate the Constitution, it's up to the, Demo uh, the democratic process to fix it or not. It is not the, that is not the role of the judiciary. The role of the judiciary is to read words in a statute, as you know, set out uh, you know, through the common law and central, and whatever, is to read the words on the page and give those words the fairest meaning that they had at the time that they were enacted. And you know, that, that's, um, that's what you do. Uh, he wrote a book uh, with Brian Gardner called Reading Law. And uh, in it, Justice Scalia has, a, has an excerpt from uh, uh, Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England, uh, section the second on... Um, Uh, second, uh, section the second of the natural, I'm sorry, of the nature of laws in general, and it is this, quote, And law, without equity, though hard and disagreeable, is much more desirable for the public good than equity without law, which would make every judge a legislator and introduce the most infinite confusion, as there would be, as there would then be almost as many different rules of action laid down in our courts, as there are differences of capacity and sentiment in the human mind. In other words, this is a, a doctrine of legal interpretation um, that essentially imposes a condition on judges so that what you have is not a state of affairs, so you don't have equity without law. Equity means fairness. Um, because if, if you have equity without law, it really is to thine own self be true. Whatever you think is fair as the judge, is what is fair, but that's not the system that we have. We have, uh, we have a system of laws enacted by a legislature uh, and enforced through the courts when, when need be. And it's the job of the judge to read the words on the page and apply them, give them their fairest meaning, and then apply them. Um, and he also takes issue with, uh, or took issue with, uh, the not not using the rule of lenity. Uh, it's called the rule of lenity in, in criminal in the criminal sphere. Uh, it's called uh, 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 contra proferendum in contract law, and it's essentially this: any ambiguity that exists in the law, uh, any ambiguity in a criminal statute or in the contract case, 
any ambiguity in a contract will be interpreted to work to the detriment of the person who drafted it because the person who was in the best position to write clearly to say exactly what they wanted to say is the person who drafted it in the first place and in criminal law that's the legislature and the legislature has written a law that does that is not crystal clear to the ordinary man the ordinary woman the ordinary citizen then the citizen is entitled to the benefit of that ambiguity in a criminal prosecution so if it's not if it's not clear you know if you can't read the statute and from that on its face recognize that this conduct or that conduct is entailed by the words on the page then there's no, there should be no criminal liability because the person has not been put on notice beforehand that what he's about to do is in fact illegal and he should not suffer any consequences because the legislature wasn't good enough to write a clear law justice Scalia unlike a lot of justices and judges and a lot of legislators sought to impose clarity in the law and to eliminate confusion and this this uh, quest to interpret, to figure out, to divine the intent of the Congress or the, or, or the legislature is a hobgoblin to American liberty. Because what it does is it, 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 for one, it replaces the job of the legislature with the interpretive art of the judge. And so the, the legislators are now free to write sloppily because when it goes to the court, the court's going to try to fashion a remedy uh, that will have it enforced the intent of the Congress, even if the Congress did not write what they exactly what they wanted on the page. And so when you do that, responsibility is bled away from the Congress because uh, the judges try to be the backstop to shore up the incompetence of the, legislat of the legislature. Same, the reason that we have the separation, uh, separation of powers is, is to keep anybody from getting too strong, but also so the electorate knows whom to blame for the fuck up. And you have a Congress that wants to siphon away executive power the Constitution says that the executive power, that all executive power is vested in a president of the United States. One person at a time. He is responsible for the executive functions. Well, the Congress has decided that there are some executive functions that shouldn't be entirely in the president's control. You know, so you get these independent regulatory agencies and other uh, stray animals, and, and the courts have decided to go along with this as opposed to saying, no, Congress, you can't turn over that. Uh, you cannot strip that from the president, like the independent counsel statute. Um, or as Justice Scalia put it, uh, sometimes cases come to this court where the wolf is clad, so to speak, in sheep's clothing, uh, that the calamitous consequences that will befall us in the future are not clear from the, legis the legislation that we're, we're deciding upon at the day and on the, the special prosecutor uh, issue. He says, but uh, this wolf comes as a wolf. Its purpose is not clear. They mean to, to do this. Anyway, and he goes, it must be a frightening thought to be the chief executive where you have to hire a uh, you have to hire a lawyer, your lawyer, the lawyer for the executive, uh, to do nothing to do nothing else in his life except to investigate your every act. Anyway, the division, the separation of powers, uh, keeps people from getting too much power. But in addition to that, it lets the people know whom to blame for all of the bad things that are happening. Uh, if it's just a bad law that has been written, it's the Congress. If it's a bad, if it's a bad implementation of a law, uh, that's the executive, and it's a bad interpretation of the law. It's the judiciary, but in the last half century or more of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, uh, the each ju the each just actually it's not even half century yet. Uh, each justice uh, seat each seat that opens on the Supreme Court is uh, replaced by a new justice who's been nominated, and now we have a political uh, maelstrom where every new justice is like a miniature constitutional convention, uh, as opposed to doing what they used to do. Uh, do you know the law? Are you learned in the law? Do you have a good temperament? Do you make sensible judgments? You're qualified. Uh, but now it's, do you agree with me on this political point or that political point? Will you, will you interpret the Constitution that I want as opposed to the, uh, interpret the Constitution that actually was written by other people? So when you, uh, all that said, so when you look at uh, the state of the law from when he went to the court to when he uh, died this month, you can see this, this transformation in the landscape of how legal instruments, how legal text is being interpreted. And that is uh, very largely due to Justice Scalia's uh, stubbornness and his, his uh, ridiculing of other people who decided to do it, to do it by different means. Um, and you lead to all these bad results uh, in the law. And he you know, wrote dissent after dissent after dissent after dissent after dissent. Forget Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes being the great dissenter. Scalia is the great dissenter. The opinions that he was dissenting on, 
years ago have now been the ones that have come to be uh, accepted doctrine in legal circles. And it's uh, when, when Kagan says that he, he changed the way that texts are interpreted, she's right. He has. Uh, it, you see very little talk about legislative history now. Very little talk about that at all. And instead, what you see is, is fair-minded textualism. Now, this, is, this doesn't guarantee that a judge is going to agree with your interpretation or not your interpretation, but it does mean that uh, we're getting more consistent results because what they're actually doing now is interpreting the same document as opposed to one judge will be interpreting a text, one judge will be interpreting a committee report. Uh, so you, you have Justice Glee on the one hand and then Justice Breyer uh, on the other, Justice Marshall on the other, uh, where you, instead of looking at the text of the statute, that's like this very low level, like tertiary concern, uh, what you need to look at are the purpose of the statute, the objective of the statute, and the consequences of the law, precisely the things that are meant to be resolved democratically, not the things that are meant to be dis uh, uh, disputed, not, not things that are meant to be resolved through a judiciary. Well, that legal lands landscape has changed. So even before I knew that Justice uh, Scalia had actually asked or uh, given Justice Kagan's name to uh, the Obama administration to appoint as the next justice when uh, Sonia Soto, before they appointed uh, Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, I didn't know that when I formed this opinion, but this cer certainly helped shore it up, that the, the actual legacy of Justice Scalia is embodied in a Justice Kagan, in that even progressives, if they want to be taken seriously in the legal profession these days, have to start speaking the language of the text that's written on the page, and they have to start dealing with that, uh, whereas in times past, uh, you did not. So as I mentioned, Thurgood Marshall was a mentor of Justice Kagan, uh, but she comes to the court writing in the voice of a Justice Scalia, writing in the style of a Justice Scalia, talking in the language of Justice Scalia as opposed to these principles that have been plucked from the ether and intent that's been devised from who know where, divine from who know where, to be foisted upon the, the American people. So of course, you know, she doesn't agree with Justice Scalia on a lot of uh, cases, they still have a different view, but they're at least now speaking the same language. And I think that is uh, what will be his greatest legacy, uh, more uh, apart from any particular decision where he might have written the opinion, the majority's opinion. It is the fact that even now, uh, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to be engaged in a different kind of conversation than you had, than you had to be engaged with uh, you know, 30 years ago in the same way that Tony Blair was an achievement of Margaret Thatcher, in that in order to be taken seriously, labor had to change, and labor had to start speaking a new, com uh, a new kind of uh, dialect. So too is that true with Justice Scalia with respect to the law. And uh, I'm very sad that he's gone, but uh, he has left a wonderful legacy, and he was a brilliant jurist. Have a great day.